A small warning for people going forward. This movie makes a lot of accusations of homosexuality and in every sub version of it that I found uses the homosexual slur liberally. So be aware going in. The werewolf game Madland is both a unique turn for the series and a drastic about face from the story and kind of theming of the lovers. Whereas the lovers seem to shine a light on the good of the people placed into this terrible situation and made to play a bad game, Madland is definitely a look at the worst kind of people who could play this game and how easy it is to give in to evil when you feel threatened. For anyone who is new, the werewolf game is a party game in which a group of players are all assigned roles with various abilities, including the villager, who has no powers, the prophet, who could see one other player's roles, the bodyguard who could protect another player but never themselves, and for this game, the madman, who is a villager but only wins if the werewolf does. The werewolf can only win by killing enough villagers that they equal the amount of remaining villagers, and the villagers fight back by having a vote every night to determine the werewolf and hopefully execute them. The werewolf movies are a series of films about high schoolers abducted by a mysterious group to play the werewolf game to the death. Usually this plays out pretty regularly with the villagers using their powers and knowledge in order to determine who the werewolf is and kill them. In this game, however, all of the players are madmen, meaning they need to protect the werewolf if they want to win, and the special villagers have to hide themselves. If you've ever read the amazing manga series Liar Game, then you might be kind of used to this trope in games like this, where one person is given an inordinate amount of power and immediately uses it to create a brutal dictatorship. I'm always apprehensive about these kinds of arcs and stories because while I enjoy movies and situations where people are pushed into doing terrible things in order to survive, I still like to hope that they were good people to an extent. Premises like Madland kind of spins that on its head by giving one player absolute dominion and making the others subordinate to them. Now, I'll admit that this is an amazing premise, and this is probably one of the most interesting games of Werewolf in the series so far, strategically, I mean. Madlands is definitely worth a watch, even if I wouldn't put it up there with the lovers overall. Now that the spoiler-free section is done, let's get into the review. We start with a girl laying in a field, tired and alone. Then it seems like we're growing closer and closer to the activities of the ones up above as we are with them as they are transporting players to their next game. As the others awaken in the game room, our heroine is already wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, but the usual panic sets in once the TV turns on. This is definitely one of the weirdest games of Werewolf so far. Not only are the cards laid out on a table instead of on them as they have been previously, this game features only one werewolf, prophet, and bodyguard. But unlike every other time, instead of being normal villagers, everyone else is a madman, and thus only win if the werewolves do. The only roll card we get to see is that of our heroine, Moe, Moe Koike, Koike? I don't know. who will play as a bodyguard this game. I'm going to call her Moe, Moe, because I don't know how to pronounce her last name. After all the rules, they perform their introductions and discuss that not only are some of them advanced players who have played the game both casually and as part of a club, but that some of them have even heard about it through the internet, further supporting the running the theme that's been developing, that this game is also becoming more and more of an urban legend amongst normal people, kind of like Hellgirl. This game also gives each player their own specified weapon, and they are not allowed to kill with anything besides that, which seems limiting at first, but is a really good wrench to throw into the mechanics of the game. Ayano and Moe meet in the kitchen by chance and lament the difficulty of this new rule set, but because they don't know who's who, neither are able to effectively console the other. At the first vote, we see the first big change of the Mad Village. There is no benefit to revealing that you're the prophet, since that means instead of being immune to voting, the villagers want you dead and can simply vote you out if they don't want to risk the bodyguard protecting them. We instead see two players claim to be werewolves. Ayano and Shoji both claim to be werewolves and agree to vote out Nageshi, who was part of a werewolf club at her school, and the rest go along with it so as to keep themselves alive. Even though they all vote for her, everyone hesitates when it comes time to execute her, except for Miki, who ends up stabbing her to death. And this is actually a really smart move, and I'll explain why when we get there. I 
Afterward, Shoji seems to be holding court over the others, even commanding one boy named Shu to lick his shoe until Shu begins to cry, before warning the others that if they don't obey him, they'll end up like him, if not dead. When Moe contests that either he or Ayano is a fake, and that one of them is the prophet reaching out for the bodyguard to protect them, Shoji simply threatens her too until Ayano points out that it's time for them to go back to their rooms. Moe decides to protect Ayano that night. A decision that returns dividends in the morning as it turns out that nobody was killed in the night. They both simply claim to have attacked the other to no avail, keeping up appearances in public. When Shoji tries to play the failure off as a good thing since he gets to be in charge for longer, Shu pushes him away, which prompts Shoji to have him eat food off of the floor. He tells Kano to hold Shu's arms, which makes Usami angry that not only would Kano do that, but that he also turned his back to his girl to be executed, which Kano refutes by saying that they were just friends. This is the kind of scene that always bothers me about the stories. Like, yes, it's probably unfortunately accurate to what some people would do with that power, and even more accurate as to what people will do to survive, but it's an unfortunate side of humanity that I don't care to see. It's the same reason I watch slasher movies, but not gore porn, you know? I want a light look, not to gaze into the abyss. I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy it. This is just my personal thought on it. Back in the movie, Moe approaches Ayano to tell her that she's the bodyguard and they need to work together. But Ayano dismisses her outright before making her way to the rooftop to demand that they split the subordinates by gender, before accusing Shoji of being a homosexual, which makes him very upset as she continues to press that he was probably bullied in high school because of it, and that's why he's behaving the way he is now. Once they're split up though, Nakagawa refuses to serve under Ayano as she can't promise her safety and abandons Ayano. That night at the vote, Shoji actually offers to kill Nakagawa, but when Ayano doesn't resist, he realizes they're not allies. When Shoji offers up Shu and Sugimoto, thinking that they're spies for Ayano, Sugimoto bows and grovels for his life. But when Shoji tries to make Shu lick his shoe again, Shu just snaps and attacks Shoji, beating him violently on the floor in front of the others, while calling him homophobic slurs. When Shu is killed by those up above for attacking another player, Shoji comments that Shu was too impatient, that Shoji has endured everything Shu had, and more, but he always endured it until he finally gained power. He then tells everyone to vote for Sugimoto, which they do, and then chase him into the hallway when he tries to escape. Shoji then tells the other guys to kill him, which they do by violently kicking and stomping him to death in the doorway. This is genuinely up there with the first kill in the entire series as one of the more uncomfortable kills for me to watch. Before they return to bed, the villagers demand that the werewolves declare their target beforehand so that they will know who is real in the morning. Ayano then asks to speak to Moe again, confessing that she is the prophet, but that she checks Shoji and he's not the werewolf. This creates a strong smokescreen, as they presume that the werewolf will continue killing others, leaving Ayano and Shoji to bicker in public while they remain hidden. As they figure out what to do, Moe takes Ayano up to one of the corpse's rooms and tells her to stab it since it'll be impossible to argue that she's killed if her designated weapon is spotless. Their theory is disproven though when that night Shoji is attacked by the werewolf. Ayano tries to claim responsibility saying she chose to kill him since if he was the prophet then the bodyguard would protect Kano to show that she's fake when they both showed up alive. Nakagawa says that She's a liar, and instead claims the real werewolf, describing what Shoji was like right before he died. She then informs the rest that it doesn't matter if they don't believe her, since if they vote for her, they'll all die anyway. Ayano and Moe meet again to try to figure out their next plan and try to think of a way to protect themselves without blowing their cover. This scene is honestly the scene that made me love this movie. The friendship between Ayano and Moe, while built on paranoia and trying to survive, is they're the only two in this game and if one of them dies that's it it's over for both of them is is so unusually pure and they're both actually good at the game making the scenes between them pretty interesting and heartwarming to watch that night at the vote neither of the werewolves pick a target so usami offers up kano for being a suck up who betrays their friends for security Kano proceeds to lash out both physically and verbally at everyone in the circle, making it easy for them to vote him out, and Moe is the one forced to actually kill him. Ayano claims that because Moe offered to kill him in the vote, that she's the one that Ayano will kill, while Nakagawa refuses to state her target, and even challenges Ayano to target her instead, since 
She can only be the bodyguard, and the bodyguard can't protect themselves. They end up dispersing, but Moe visits Aino again, showing her that she put blood on the handle of her knife, in case the werewolf uses the handle on her victim that night. She comforts Aino by telling her that they'll both make it through this by working together, and promises to protect her before returning to her room. That night, Akagawa, who is the real werewolf, chooses Moe. When she attempts to attack her though, Moe manages to fight her off before bludgeoning herself in the head repeatedly with the remote control in her room. She then falls out of the window and onto the floor outside as Nakagawa watches in confusion. We see her laying on the floor, as we did in the beginning of the movie, before her collar tightened, killing her. The next day, Aino stands on the roof, unsure of what to do when Nakagawa approaches her, telling her that Moe killed herself and won't be able to protect Aino anymore, thus making Nakagawa the victor. During the vote, the villagers say that they won't be victims this time, and they refuse to vote for each other, and demand proof that the werewolves are who they say they are. When they notice the blood on the handle of Aino's knife matches the wounds on Moe's body, they declare her the werewolf and vote for Nakagawa. In her last moments, Moe had done everything she could think of to make sure Aino would win. She bludgeoned herself open, fell out the window, and took Aino's ribbon out of her pocket so that it would be almost insurmountable evidence. Despite what Nakagawa believed, Moe was still able to protect Aino. Aino calls for the vote and they choose Nakagawa, who is personally killed by Aino. The TV comes to life to inform them that the werewolves have been eliminated and the villagers win. The remaining madmen are executed as Aino stands alone. She then makes her way outside to visit Moe's body, weakly trying to take her ribbon back for a moment before giving up and leaving it with her. She then stands up and walks away from this game. I stand by my initial review of this movie. It's definitely both uncomfortable and amazing in near equal measure. The pureness and wholesomeness of Aino and Moe's relationship over the series is on par with that of the werewolves in The Lovers or the werewolf and villager in The Beast Side. I'm going to avoid names both because I don't remember them and I don't want to spoil it for someone who started here and wants to go back. There's a playlist now by the way, with all of the werewolf movies in order. The small smile that Moe gives before she falls out of the window because she knows that she and Ayana won this game still brings me joy to think about. The first half with Shoji is definitely not for me. And even through rewatches, I get real uncomfortable with those scenes, but it's not enough to make me turn off the film or even discourage anyone from seeking it out. Like I discourage people from Prison Break. It's nothing too bad. I, th I definitely still recommend Mad Lens. I don't think it would topple the lovers from the top of my list, but it's definitely up there with the B-side for the top three. Next week, we'll look at something else, but after that is the Inferno, which is sadly the end of the Werewolf Game series until Death Game's Operator is subtitled and available for download. I am so happy that I found this series of movies. And if my numbers and comments are anything to go by, then these movies are how a lot of you found me. Or even better, I got to show these to you and help you find a new series that you enjoy. Which is all I ever really wanted to do with this channel. Thank you for sharing this with me. You're all friends to me. Good night. It's a very, very bad.